So um, welcome from wherever you tuning in. Um, thanks for joining us. This is the final already uh, panel of this year's 154 forum. And uh, we're very happy to close off actually with a panel where we also have <clears throat> Antis, the artist whose quote is actually the title of the whole um, forum. So uh, yeah, big honor for us to have you joining us. And um, I'm just gonna um, quickly also introduce Gabriela Salgado, who's gonna moderating this panel and then uh, hand over to her. As you've maybe already seen, the talk is in Spanish, but we have like a simultaneous translation. So whatever suits you best, you can choose right below um, the channel, either English or Spanish. And also the whole conversation is being recorded. So if you have to leave earlier, or if you have any friends that uh, couldn't join today, just tell them that actually there will be recording of this conversation on the YouTube channel of 154 and also as a podcast on Spotify. And also you're more than welcome to share comments, thoughts, questions in a chat section. We will make sure that um, it will get to the participants. So um, thanks Gabriela for uh, doing the moderation today. Uh, Gabriela is an Argentine born curator and consultant working internationally. Um, she obtained an MA in curating contemporary art from the Royal College of Art. She has curated a large number of exhibitions and has lectures in over 20 countries. She, spe she specialized in Latin American art as a curator of the Latin American art collection at Essex University, uh, UECLLA from 1999 to 2005 and was a curator of public programs at Tate Modern from 2006 to 2011. She curated La Otra Biennale in Bogota, Colombia in 2013 and the second biennial of Thessaloniki in Greece in 2009. She also acted as a jury member for the Prince Claus Awards and Video Brazil Festival. She created Transatlantic Connections, a program of exchanges for African and Latin American artists, which ran between 2011 and 2016. And between 2017 and 2020, she worked as artistic director of Titui Contemporary Art in Auckland, New Zealand. So thank you so much. Um, now the floor is yours and uh, we see all of you uh, later in, at the end of the talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Yvette, for your, for your introduction to Julia and to Olivia for all her assistance as well. Uh, it is an honor for me to be part of this discussion because um, I've been um, uh, doing uh, a lot of projects trying to create a dialogue to build a bridge between Latin America and Africa in the contemporary art scene. Um, this happened uh, because, as you said, Yvette, I started as a curator of Latin American art when I worked for the collection at the University of Essex. And uh, from uh, my first visit to West Africa, when I went to Dakar for the Dakar Biennale in Senegal, I felt an incredible familiarity with um, the, the, the tropes that the artists and my colleagues, the curators, in Africa were discussing, there was a, a very similar position we were in, in relation to the canon that all of our countries had been imposed through an education that was particularly focused on Western modernity as a paradigm. And uh, it didn't take into account the difficulty of learning that in environments that were very different to the environment of Europe or North America, um, and also creating a lot of disparities in that in the channels of communication and presentation of the work uh, in relation to other artists from those um, um, hegemonic countries. So the conversations were so incredibly familiar to me that I felt that I needed to create opportunities for artists to go from one side to the other and become acquainted with those realities on the other side of the Atlantic, but also, or in the case of Peru or, or some parts of Mexico, Colombia, with the Pacific, um, but also, you know, create the opportunity to understand contemporary uh, Africa for Latin Americans, because there is a, there is a very um, widespread misconception of Africa as a place of 
um, ancient culture, which is true, there is an ancient culture, but also the dynamism of contemporary culture in Africa, which is astonishing, is missed in that kind of romanticization of Africa that has to do with the array issue of Africa in the history of Latin America. So uh, my intention was to create a dialogue and created projects inviting artists from both sides. So took African artists to Colombia and Colombian artists to Africa and the same work with Nigeria and I did work with Senegal and Brazil. And the idea was to create this synergy and the dialogue. Um, so when I heard that this forum was devoted to the relations of, um, in a way to evoke this, this, this um, common ground for African um, Afro-Latin American artists in the context of the, of the 154 uh, Art Fair, which is primarily devoted to African art and art of the diaspora. Uh, Latin America is not normally considered the diaspora for some strange reason. When you talk about diaspora in the world, people think of the United States, uh, but rarely of South America. Uh, or North America, but Mexico, which is in North America, but is part of the construction of Latin America as a concept. So all these um, topics are normally left aside. And when Latin American artists represent their countries in Biennales, it's very rare that they are um, Afro-Latin American or indigenous Latin American. So um, it is something that we need to change. And to change that, this platform is excellent. And I want to thank you for creating not only um, from the beginning of contemporary art, contemporary and Latin America as a, as, a, as a writer's platform for these issues to be um, presented and uh, for the inclusion of Latin American artists of African descent, but also that this fair also starts looking at Latin America as a place where Africa exists. Uh, so having said this, it's a very long introduction. Um, I will now go on to introducing the artist in English. And after that, I will speak in Spanish directly to the artist and we start listening to them. So thank you for listening. Um, we will start with Gabi Messina. Gabi Messina is a visual artist born in Buenos Aires, Argentina in 1971. Her research and productions invite to reflect on different approaches to societies, behaviors, history, customs, documentary stories, but also interpretations of imaginaries, developing concepts that are built through contact with people. She uses fiction, experimental and documentary films, photographies, photo montage, creates installations, writes and publishes pictures, picture books and texts. Her works are translated into English, Portuguese, and French. She published five books, Gabi Messina, La Riviere Press, 2008, Lima, Kilometer 100, Retina, de Gustavo Santaolalla Press, 2010, Faith, 2014, Maestros, El Bosque y el Árbol, 2016, and Saber Ver, 2016. In October 2019, she was invited by for the, by the Argentine Embassy of Maputo in Mozambique, an Argentine Embassy of South Africa, for an exhibition of her multimedia work, Argentina Afro at the Market, Photoshop in Johannesburg, an embassy in Mozambique. She lives and works in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Coral Carvalho uh, was born in Poza Rica, Veracruz, Mexico in 1987. She explores recurrently new visual narratives related to identity, violence, and territory, in addition to expanding the frontiers of photography from journalism, the visual arts, and the documentary approach. And finally, Entes, Juan Jimenez Suero lives and works in Lima, Peru. With a long history in the street art scene, his work has passed through countries such as Germany, France, Portugal, Spain, United Arab Emirates, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and the entire American continent. During his artistic practice, the roots in front of the gaze of that minority of the other 
have been evident. Consequently, the presence of symbols and signs in relation to elements that coexist with a complex city such as Lima, violence, inequality, and above all social injustice demand from the Latin American spectator a relationship of belonging to the city they inhabit in a current context. The transversal topic that the artist proposes in his work is to transfer from his interpretation the dialogue that a city establishes with art according to its own means of representation, such as labels, tags, scratches, phrases, etc. So without further ado, I would like to switch now into Spanish and start talking to the artist. Thank you very much. Welcome, Ente, Gabi and Corral. It is a pleasure for me to meet you personally and to start with this acknowledgement which I had just expressed of the interest I have in this particular topic. Thank you for being present and thank you for representing somehow in this event, so many artists which had been somehow at the margin of the narrative of the history of contemporary art in our countries. And I would really like to make reference to the quote by Entis, which is the quote which uh, um, defines the whole 154 forum this year which is a quote that when I read it for the first time, it really uh, struck me as something very peculiar. And I wanted to ask you why. Why do you feel as a New York black person trapped in Peru? Why New York? Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you. And I would like to say hi to everyone who is here and to our colleagues who are also waiting for the turn, our artists. I've always had a very close relationship with not New York because of what I have, because the reason why I made a decision on my lifestyle, many people think that the relationship with hip hop or with graffiti, it's like in the uh, midst of the purest sort of art. It is like a secondary art. It's something that is only um, an, um, sort of a something aside, really. I really think this is something that boosts and f encourages me to go forward. I think that more um, seriousness in small things within this conversation between the dialogue of the Latin American who feels himself or herself trapped uh, within a culture, within a context which it doesn't exist in Peru. In Peru, we don't have Peru uh, hip hop. Uh, it has never been famous hip hop music like in Mexico, Colombia, or in Brazil. In Peru, we don't have hip hop. But on the other hand, we do have graffiti uh, art. So I have in Calle 13, I have been in a clip video when we also have Susanna Bata. Uh, I've represented my country with different brands who called me to do some uh, publicity, but within my country, the type of art I do is only like an adornment, really. Um, it is the gap I'm trying to um, fill in, really. It's just the indigenous people and the black person has been uh, considered or regarded in a different way by the white person. So it is um, this gap that creates a huge divide with regards to what we do, the result, and who are you, who do you see yourself, and what do you listen to, and who do you follow, and so forth. So I believe when I say these words that I feel trapped in Peru, but I would like to be in New York, or I belong to that culture, I mean that I am that kind of person who sees this life like the uh, extra fast type of lifestyle, which is when you live in New York, how fast things are when you listen to this music that was created in that neighborhood at that time. It's like so many different situations which go around the uh, all these things that I've created within my history, within my work. Understood. Thank you. 
and somehow um, extrapolating this experience of yours to other contexts because you three, you come from social and cultural diverse backgrounds. I mean, Argentina is different from Mexico, Mexico is different pro from Peru and so forth, but there is some common ground which um, really are present in your experiences. And I would like to hear from you, your personal and professional experiences that both you, Gabi and Coral, we can start by Gabi, that you've heard you in Argentina, Gabi, with regards to how your message and the message of your work is received in Argentina, which is your public. How is your experience of working with what you do in a context that without any, any, any sort of secrets, I can say because I am Argentina, Argentina is racist. So how do you think the work you're doing is received in Argentina? Thank you. Thank you for this space. Thank you for the possibility of being able to share this work not only in Argentina, but in the world. As you rightly said, Gabriela, just a few people who are ready to listen about this topic, just a few people who are working on this topic in my country. Well, with the joy of finding more and more people, more collectives, which uh, also t tackle different uh, subjects, not only the visual arts, but music, theater, literature. So increasingly we are more, but it is never enough. We want to break a huge, long history of habits and to really think hard because we've been imposed this since we were very little children on the identity, which is a false identity of a nation, white and European nation. That is the identity we've been imposed. So when we start talking about this context, well, let's start from scratch. It's like we have to break down everything, we have to take everything down, we have to start from zero, we have to re-educate our children, boys and girls, who are starting and they should, they must start thinking differently to be able to break down those paradigms that our grandparents and our parents and our predecessors uh, have so we have to start generating a collective fight against our history, our present time in order to build our future. So I think it is important to work at the school levels where the identity uh, just a few years ago, and this is just amazing, blackness was represented painting the children with some kind of um, a product where we will lit it up and there was some kind of black ink. Uh, so that's what the way we will paint children to represent blackness with a cork, a lit up cork, we would just paint the children and to uh, represent the black people as very humble people, people who were on the streets, working in the streets. This is a short film I directed, I wrote it, and it's basically trying to break down the paradigm. So here we have the girl represented here as a street vendor. So she goes to the stage of this um, school act and she says, I am not a slave, she says. So she starts um, undressing herself and she is wearing a uniform of a, of a soldier really. So she says, I'm not a slave, I serve my country. I am Maria Remedio del Valle. So luckily today we have a need, a very um, tangible need in different culture um, subjects. We claim 
the memory of our captain of our country, who is Maria Remedio del Valle. She's the representative of the Afro-Argentinian people. But, and I would like to say there is a great ignorance with all this in our country. You know this very well, Gabriela. And not only an ignorance, there's also an um, invisibility. It is also a denial. And there is also this idea of saying that things are foreign. For example, if a person is a black person, so she or he cannot be Argentinian. No, they cannot be Argentinian. You are Latin America. You are from abroad. You are foreigner. You are North American. You are African, but you can never be Argentinian. Supposedly, we come from Italians, from Spaniards. So, yes. There are, uh, there are lots of works, really. I mean, there's so much to do. In my first approach with this topic, it was the first play, um, my first piece of work. We can look for it in the images. It is a daisy appealing to this romantic act. We've all done this when we were children, boys and girls, uh, to have um, approach to love and the first lover or the first person really with whom I have a crush on, I'm starting to do this with a daisy. She loves me, she loves me not. Uh, but the video really wants to show these black hands receiving the petals of the flower, a flower which has been already had been taking off the petals, going back with the petals on the days, saying, uh, does Argentina loves me? Does my mom? My mother is Afro and my dad is European. Do you see me? Do you love me, Argentina? We are a mixed race country. But what we have to understand is that it has nothing to do with the pigmentation of your skin. It has to do with what you feel. It has to do with an attitude. It has to do with a black awareness. It has to do with the uh, traits I look in the mirror and I feel I do have the African um, features because all my life I've been called negra, which is black. Uh, I've felt also discrimination in the school when I was a child, but it was just an, uh, a story really, an anecdote of so many years. It hasn't been very intense. So I wonder how difficult when it happens to you all the time, when you feel you don't belong how hard it must be. So in my opinion today, I'm very happy, I'm very, um, I do have uh, lots of enthusiasm because through my work I can really invite others to reflect upon this. Also, I would like to tell you that this year, because of the pandemic, It has to be cancelled, but for the first time, it's going to be included in the National Registry of Argentina. The question, if you acknowledge yourself as Afro-descendant, this is really a historic step forward. And tomorrow, that's so, during so many years, we've uh, celebrated the day of the race on the 12th of October because of the discovery of America. Finally, we are celebrating the respect towards diversity. We're not talking about races. We need to stop talking about races. In my country, unfortunately, black people, women and men, they are poor people. They are illiterate people. They are people who don't have um, good manners. It is a person who can throw litter and you say, look at this um, shitty black person. That's what we say in this country. It is so many things that we need to change here. Yes, lots of things we need to change. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. It has also to do with the way we have been taught history as history has been taught in our countries. It is a key tool to change the 
uh, conduct of um, population in the future. We have to bear in mind that at the beginning of the 20th century, Argentina had 30% of the Buenos Aires population was from African uh, descend 50 uh, percent in the previous um, century towards the end but with the Paraguay war many of them died because many soldiers who were sent to this very cruel war because both countries Paraguay and Argentina they both lost many soldiers but they were the black Africans who majorly um, came went to were sent to those wars but also the yellow fever there was a great epidemic of typhus a yellow fever towards the um, 20s that also killed so many black population in buenos aires with lots of immigration to uruguay there's a lot of race mixed race in as well there were lots of marriages uh, between Afro descendants and um, European descendants because the Europeans came with a large number to Argentina. It was one of the largest immigration of Europeans into Argentina throughout 100 years since 1850, where the uh, plan of uh, populating Argentina with Europeans to bring progress to the country and also it. Uh, led to the indigenous genocide. This started in 1850 and it finished after the Second World War. Sorry, Gabriela. Yes, what you're saying is very interesting because when you talk about the migration from Europe, white and European migration that, uh, well, thousands and thousands of ships that came throughout all these years into Argentina. We talk about a whitening campaign. Yes, completely. That was a whitening campaign for our nation. And then we are like, wow. Yes, exactly. I would like to offer the opportunity to Coral to talk about your experience from Veracruz, which is the place regarded as the most African place in Mexico, isn't it? Could you please tell us about your experience as an artist, your life experience, and why or how are you trying to change the perception of diversity? of the Mexican people. And this is not uh, about, I mean, no, nobody talks about that. They talk very much about the indigenous Mexican people, but not the African descendants. Uh, there were like a half a million enslaved Africans who arrived in Veracruz at the time of the colony. It is interesting to see how this has been deleted from the Mexican history and nobody talks about this. Tell us a little bit, what is your role as an artist? What do you want to convey with your uh, work, but especially tell us about the history. Hello, Gabby and Gabriela and Enters. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk in this forum. I am very honored to be able to participate. Well, there's so many questions and so many things. I will start to try to answer some of them. Okay, so I am, um, I think I would like to talk about my personal experience. I would like to share it with you, which is very much connected with the history of this country. So in this country, only a year ago, after 500 years, the constitution has acknowledged that there were Afro descendants in Mexico 500 years, which had been deleted from the institutional history, but also deleted in the personal experience of each family. And this is where my story, my personal story comes in. I started to work with this topic. I've always, I'm a photographer, I'm a photographer. So I've always worked from very, very personal processes, but from uh, processes from the unconsciousness and with the need of telling something, of sharing something, there's a need that is requesting me to say it. It's a very free way to work. This is a personal project for me. So that is why I've started to work on this. So in this particular project, so many questions ar arise. I mean, questions which have to do with my origin, with my family. And 
there is a picture I sent to you, which is from my personal files. It is a personal picture of mine, which um, it really has to do with my search or my commitment is the second one. This one. So it has to do, this picture is of my brother. I took this picture when we were children in the zoo. And when I went to revisit it, my files on my origins, I could really see these features of the Afro descendancy in my family, not only in my mother's side, but also in the, my father's side family. I realized so many things are my needs. Why did I want to talk about these? It is very complex because it is this country, people say we don't have black people here. And therefore people say that here we don't have racism. And it's very complex because um, obviously there is lots of racism here, but people try to deny racism and they even try to hide it beneath the bed. They try to hide this origin or the grandmother or the grandfather who are black. That is why really it really resonates what Gabby said. So my project has uh, become it is a personal project, completely personal project where I am. I am conducting a research and history, but also my own history. So my main approach with Afro descendant communities which acknowledge themselves Afro-descending, Afro-descendant communities in Veracruz, there is a community called Coyolillo, where I started to work since 2014. And in that particular community, I could notice that although they acknowledge they are Afro-descendants, it is still something they deny. It is something which is not fully accepted. This has to do with uh, ways of representing themselves, which um, have to do with the whitening of the soap operas of all this publicity on TV. So I started there in Coliolillo, but this research has been extended. It is a, an ongoing project. I have to make this clear. I don't know if we're going to have some time where we can talk more Oh, I just can do it because I would like to explain some chapters of this piece of work, which I think are important. Gabby, can I do it now or shall we do it later? Now? Okay. So this uh, work has different chapters. So the name is We've Always Been Here. That's the name of the project. We've always been here. It is a reminder and also an appeal to the lack of acknowledgement or the failure to acknowledge these roots in Mexico. They've always uh, taught us in the schools that here we have a mixing of race between the Spaniards and the indigenous and the Africans. No, we don't have any Africans in our history. Whereas really, they are the ones who fought. The Africans really came into this with the body and the blood to build up this nation. There's also a huge lack of knowledge on our history. For example, Vicente Guerrero, Jose Maria Morelos, they are black heroes, but the history and literally they had whitened them in these uh, paintings and these portraits. They have been portrayed as white. Vicente Guerrero was one of the first presidents. He was a black person. He's the one who uh, really moved forward the slavery uh, abolition law. I mean, when you're interested in this, you have to start to notice this, but in the common history, it's not something relevant. And I think we start have to talk about, we have to start creating our own heroes, but also people who represent us or who represent this sort of hidden away history. The first chapter, it is this one I was telling you, saying that we don't have uh, black people here, which has to do with the fact that somehow we deny these roots. And what I use is the family photo album as a strategy to sort of um, fight against this denial and thinking that, well, they've always been there. Our 
um, father, our parents, our um, grandparents, but the history has never allowed us to see them. The second chapter of this work is what history owes us. It is a journey. Can we go to the other picture? Yeah, the one, that's the one. It is a journey throughout different areas in Mexico where I started to recover, but also to collect these um, stories, which I started to investigate in different files, which have to do with um, um, killings and fights, and also with repression to uh, Afro descendants in Mexico, to the Africans in Mexico since the colonial era. What I'm doing is to go to these places and through the landscape and through some um, staging that I start creating, what I'm doing is to reflect upon these and to reflect with the landscape itself, to let the landscape tell us about the history. This is also a chapter which has to do with a visual fight, which has to do and is very much committed with memory and with justice. And the third one, the third chapter talks about the new generation it is a collaboration project with uh, young people from different Afro descendant communities, which are looking for justice in this present moment. This is a way of investigating these fights, which have been going on for several years now. And also because I think that although it has been sold to us as this slavery story, can we go to the picture of this lady? Yes. This is um, from this chapter. She's called Gisela Lopez. And what I'm interested with this chapter is how, I mean, really to investigate this fight. I believe it's not something that is a fashionable thing. It's not something that just started now. It comes from so many years and how this young generation is a product of all these fights. It is something very necessary within the project to really address this topic and to talk with these young people. I've spoken for a long time now. Um, I think I'm going to stop now. Thank you very much, Coral. I was thinking there's so many coincidences in our countries where you're talking about Guerrero, Manuel Belgrano in Argentina, also he was an Afro-descendant and nobody mentions that in history as an African and the portraits in the history portraits, he appears as a European white man. Is that correct, Gabby? We can't hear you, you're muted. Yes, Ribadavia as well, our first president of, yeah, at the United Nations. He was black. He was very black indeed. And in the, in the registry, there were classifications according to the shades, to the different kind of um, skin shades, like the, in the casts of Mexico, which are horrible, the taxonomy, which had to do with the different degrees of uh, race mixing, mixing, which were classified in the colonial era, and they created a, um, a category of access, which still remains present in our countries. It's a category which indicates your ability as a human being to access the education system, the university, to be able to have a good job, uh, to progress in life. And somehow from what I also heard from the Colombian uh, artist in the previous uh, event, I saw this in Colombia as well, which is a country with um, a huge ethnic diversity with more than 80 indigenous ethnicities and with a huge Afro population in the Valle. Uh, region because of historical reasons, because they were there due to work, as it happened in many parts of our countries where the enslaved people came here as a workforce. It is interesting how these um, aspects of different cultural spaces 
are preserved. As Enten said, the street art, which is also a way of lowering the category when you call it a street artist or a street art, the graffiti or the wall painting, for example, the public painting is like a subcategory of art. It's like if a visual art, the proper visual art, I mean, the one which is correct, is the only one who worked in different means using the painting, sculpturing, photography, but that the street art, the one done on the public walls of the street is inferior. So there are some threads and there are lots of silos, which is very closed up. And these are the Colombian artists said that the Afro presence in Colombia is huge in the music, like it is in the United States, like hip hop, R&B, or the uh, civil rights movement in the United States, soul, pop, jazz. And even if you go backwards in history, you get back to the 18th uh, or 19th century with the music brought from slaves from Mali and Nigeria. And all this music uh, came together, they evolved, and they've created what we are listening to now following all this evolution chain. So within this context or in the sports uh, world, the Afro-descending um, uh, representation is very well respected, but in the visual arts, it seems that the black people don't have a passport to access. Could you please share your experience with us? So sorry, I jumped in, but it was so interesting. Everything you are talking about, the what happens in each country, and I know them both in Argentina and Mexico because I've visited those countries several times, and it has happened to me many things as you probably uh, imagine. I am a bit darker, so this is more obvious in those countries. So in Argentina, it happened to me once I was waiting for a taxi uh, for more than an hour. Why? Because taxi drivers just didn't want to stop for me. And I only realized when another black person picked me up, I mean, a driver, a taxi driver, a black taxi driver picked me up and I told him, I've been here. I was so mad because it was just impossible. They didn't pick me up. It was a very, you know, it was in the city center in Buenos Aires. It was just amazing, unbelievable. So uh, it was my first time in Argentina. I was a tourist and this was happening to me. And he told me, nobody's going to pick you up because you are black. And I was so moved. Similarly, when I noticed that I was Afro descendant, I was five years of age, my mom, worked. My mom is a PT teacher and my father was a math teacher. My mom used to work in two schools at the same time and I was five and my mom took me to a sort of kind of celebration of a top, very wide, elitist, rich people school. I was playing around while my mom was doing her work and a girl came to tell me that she didn't want to play with me because I was black. And my intent was to go back to my mom saying, cry, mom, how do I take it off? How can't I be part of this other world? I mean, that happened to me when I was five. I mean, this is uh, something that although my parents tried to sort of wash, as you can say, to, to, to wash my origin, because my uh, surnames are Suero and Jimena say, no, you're not that black. No, that's what my parents said. No, you're only black because you, you are tired, because we're very, we're living very close to the coast, to the beach, and that's where you get darker. But that really um, only allowed me to um, see more stops and my, more problems. I mean, my friends went into a party and I wasn't allowed to go there. And if somebody came to pick me up, I couldn't go into the party. Also, people said, no, no, you're not going to go through this door. You're going to have go through the back door and I didn't understand so many things and um, this hatred really that generated is pure hatred really against this system started to build up and I decided when I was 15 years of age I decided that the way or the mean to show and to 
put in evidence that we are here, that we exist, and we are a huge majority in this country. As in Mexico, diversity is amazing. It's just unbelievable. And we're very, very similar countries, Mexico and Peru. It's just impossible not to see in a street in Lima and to say that we are a huge majority, the mixed race, mixed race of black people, of indigenous people. Everything I do, I listen to Nicome Santa Cruz and I listen to Victoria Santa Cruz. They are Afro-descendant artists who were very well respected and they were very high respected people of Afro-descendant uh, among the Afro uh, dynamics. So here we have lots of different names like, um, I mean, I am a Negro Lacio, which means I am a black person with a straight hair. So you have lots of classifications in, in Peru. I have an uncle who has Afro hair. The, my mom's sister has Afro hair. And Saturdays and Sunday in my grandma house, that was a very typical African party. The acceptation here, the acceptance of black people. I mean, black person, they are good for dancing, for singing, to play football for sports. But black people can't be good for painting, no. They can't be good to study. No, no good. Within all these um, schemes, I've been able to break down. I've also, in this country, I've been able to have a scholarship in one of the top schools of my country, which is called Corriente Alterna. That's the name of one of the top schools. And nowadays, I'm fighting for the acceptance of the curators and gallery owners, among others. I had to uh, build up a street dance, which was completely disregarded. It's not, it wasn't a market. So I um, made a gallery. Uh, I did also prepare, organized the first Latin American festival of a street dance. It was uh, considered one of the top 15 festivals of the world. Why well, gathered all Latin America in that festival? So my work has always had this relationship with these Afro people or these African descending people who are exposed to all this mixture. This particular piece of work talks about all this um, mixture, these different type of um, posters came from people com coming from the Andes. Um, they are called Chucha, or, and they came from the Andean, Andean uh, region to Lima, how the black Blackness is within them, as uh, Bella Santa Cruz says, the indigenous people with the float, uh, flute and uh, the black people with their own instruments. Both races had been enslaved. Both races, both ethnicities, indigenous and black people had been taken and removed from their space. Yesterday, there was a controversy because I posted in Facebook saying we cannot celebrate anything on the 12th of October tomorrow because we will be celebrating the largest genocide in the planet. And another colleague of mine who's Italian and he's a painter said, no, it's not really that. And I'm trying to, I mean, I, I use a, a Trump, a Trump card, uh, but Inca Tupayupanqui, the indigenous uh, leader, it was the first Inca indigenous person who left to the, uh, to Asia. That is why we have some uh, registers saying that they went to the, to, uh, conquer and they taught the uh, the people in the Polynesia to uh, make the pottery and everything and this uh, history and that is why these people from the Polynesia they do have these sort of Latin American traits I mean they these African people got and arrived in Ecuador where they um, set to leave. I mean, so there had been this connection between these indigenous American, Latin American people going to the Asia, to the Polynesia. So there's also these uh, portraits of people with these um, facial uh, features. And this person, this European friend was discussing with me that there hadn't been a map of what uh, Tanguantisuyo had been. There was the registry of what the Spaniards, the Italians, the Germans, and the Portuguese had arrived in our lands. And that's where the story, the, the history starts. I'm sorry, fuck them, because um, 
this is uh, deeper than something that started when they arrived here. It is deeper than the genocide they conducted and how they brought this black blood to paint our life with taste, with color and with music. I believe this watch, um, all this, I mean, I really get goosebumps. So I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing such a personal story with us. I had another question, which was a generic question, and it had to do with um, with your work, because you sort of uh, take this problem or this issue outside your countries, and you are representatives of so many dystopias and um, historic misunderstandings that us as Latin America, we have to um, carry all the time. But uh, in doing so, you have the opportunities to open up doors for your communities, for your um, fellow citizens, for your families. And we hope that through the work we do in the art world, which is a very limited uh, world, really, although we are globalized, and it is a uh, world of which is really booming now we hope that we will be able to change the reality in our countries because now you were sharing with us you've lived in new york you've lived and you've worked in all different latin american countries gabi has been in mozambique wonderful place to connect to africa and south africa my work in africa in western africa also your work um Coral, with uh, journalists uh, with photographers with a collective you've created i mean this dissemination you're doing of these issues we hope that they could be supported by institutions in your own countries. I hope, we hope that whatever you do can be supported in your countries, but also that this visibility given to you by the possibility of going abroad, of being the spoke people of this, could really come back in a better acknowledgement and social justice in our countries. Not only justice in the art scene, but that the art could be a tool to extend this conversation on the rights of the whole citizenship because we are still living the coloniality, the colonial era. We're almost reaching the end. We don't have much time, so I would like to thank you. I would like to know if the public has any question because we only have just uh, over five minutes to answer questions from the public. There is one specific one. So I'm going to ask is Natalie Salazar Martin. I'm going to um, read in English. So how do we color the world and history? How do we redefine the world through the eyes of Africans and Afro-descendants without looking for the white up approval, the white measuring of what is worth and what has value? How can we do that? through the art, how white vision of the world was broadly trans transmit through art throughout the centuries. Um, ¿Han entendido la pregunta? Do you understand the question? Would you like to answer? I don't know if he's answering, but I would like to leave more questions. I think it's just good just to, to leave more uh, uh, questions here up in the air. It is not only the art, it's the system really. The system somehow has been trained from the black, oh, sorry, from the whiteness. Uh, beyond the color of the skin, yes, we have to accept we do have privileges according to the pigmentation of your skin or according to the color of your skin. But also, I think we have to sort of uh, take everything out of the whiteness in our mind because we've been told that to live well, to live a good life is to live as white people. What if we don't want to live like that? How am I going to have a good life? How am I going to have a better life without thinking or aspiring to what white people have as good lives? I think in art, in the art world to see that. It is not uh, by chance, it is also a system where you see everything reflected. So I would just to leave 
uh, another question. How do we really want to live without um, aspiring to live the life white people live? How, I mean, we don't want to take out these from our skin color. The best thing to do is to remove the whiteness we have in our mind. Yes, it is the decolonization of our mind to start with, and then with institutions, with education, which is key to change and to rewrite history. There's another question from the public on, um, on the following. Do you have any um, uh, philanthropic entities or any support systems that will help you out in your practice? In a particular case, in my country, there isn't any support from the government to Afro-descendants who are artists. In fact, this year, through the pandemic, they are giving some vouchers, which supposedly would be with preference to Afro-descendant. That was for the first time in our history, some kind of preference to black people and indigenous. There's obviously a uh, greatest uh, debt uh, towards the indigenous in our countries because all the blood they had um, shed, but the Afro-descendant has been left aside. We don't have those funding. And if there are the these funding is only for the music industry, for the music practices. What about Argentina? Well, in Argentina, it is very weak, this support. I mean, it is starting very recently, really. We're starting to see more interest, as I was telling you at the beginning. But uh, yes, as Entes is saying, the uh, strength really is in music. Well, luckily, it is such an important identity in our country, such as tango or um, folk music, which talks about our um, predecessors. With regards to visual art, it is very weak, the support. It's like so much to do. We do have some mentorship programs, but um, they are very much general. They are not, they are not specific for a call for um, work for in order to decolonize this mind and to start from zero, as I said, from the beginning. So there's so much to do, so much to do. But I would like to thank you once again for this space. It is so powerful, isn't it? It is so powerful, this voice you're giving us to share in an international way our work. It is really uh, an honor, a privilege. I am very, very deeply thankful and grateful for the interest and for the possibility. And also to tell my colleagues, I would love to stay in touch with you because it is so good to be able to uh, communicate, to have this dialogue among the countries and to be able to boost and to encourage our work. We have another question. Thank you, Pauline from Pauline de Sousa saying, Body and would very much like to find ways to support what you're doing. So what we will do is to put you in touch with Pauline uh, to have a conversation with her. Uh, switching into Spanish now, sorry. Uh, Pauline de Sousa. Sorry, so Pauline de Sousa is offering to you. She would like to work with you. She has a, an organization which supports these uh, projects and she would like to talk to you. What I'm going to do I know how to get in touch with Pauline, so I will put you in touch. Thank you, Pauline. Coral, do you want to say something else? Just to wrap up? I, it really resonated with me very much what Entis just said. A few days ago, I was uh, listening to a conference of a friend of mine, his Afro-descendant, his Hugo Arellanes, he's also a photographer. And I remember it really resonated with what um, he said, because in this country, uh, this is something on the side, just to answer the question. Yes, in this country, we do have some um, incentives to create. As Gabby said, it's more generic, really, this kind of incentives. Any Mexican, any person can apply. But I believe they, um, they only recently 
we're starting to have some funding, but more towards cinema. And that is where the very powerful reflection from my friend Hugo. And he says, in this country, they only give us funding if we want to do something on dance, if we want to do something on uh, the popular culture or folk culture. So I think it is also a request um, that I've seen in other artists. We have to stop uh, talking about the folk or, or dancing. In my case, we this has happened to me. It's like dancing is the um, showroom. The most interesting thing is behind the showroom. The fight is behind. And also, I think there's so many issues which are cross-cutting with the Afro-descendant population, which has to do with the drug dealing, with the violence. And obviously, this kind of work is not interesting for governments and institutions. They're not interested in financing that. And I think it's something I wanted to uh, say something on this, because it's very important in this country. We also have to start funding work from Afro-descendants, but also the Afro-descendants who are sharing and talking about these issues, which are uh, something uh, which um, really hurt us because we start saying, oh, what about the drug dealing in Mexico? Yes, where does it come from? These communities, yes, they are more vulnerable also to fall into this uh, trap, really, which has to do with a an, an equal background of the history itself, how history has forgotten and has left aside these population. Now, obviously, this has been a very interesting place for the uh, violence and for the illegal acts like drug dealing. I will have to thank you, three of you, and to pass uh, the gift of floor really to Yvette because. It is um, after five o'clock. I would like to tell you it has been a pleasure to talk to you. Please count on me, write to me if you would like to talk and to um, exchange ideas and projects and to see how we can uh, get you in touch among yourselves and with other artists and really hope that the three of you, Gabi has been to Africa. I hope Corral and Enti could go to the continent because they are going to find yourself and you're going to find wonderful partners in the continent to work with and that would be great. I've been to Luanda. Oh, in Angola, great. I've never been to the continent. It would be a dream for me to be able to go to Africa. I wish this could happen and that you all make your dream come true. Thank you very much for your work. Thank you for the generosity of being able to share with us your work and your life. Thank you very much and see you soon. So thanks so much for sharing from us to very touching and deep thoughts and experiences. We were very, are still very touched from what you, you know, shared with us. It was really amazing because, you know, these conversations are so important you know and um, in order to build networks and keep on building net networks and learn about the practices of each other because yeah this is what it's all about you know in terms of in, you know to strengthen relationships and empower each other etc so thanks so much to you it was amazing and um thanks to all of you means all the fantastic panelists uh, who joined us and shared their thoughts during the last days um, um, as part of this uh, 154 forum um, and we had really I just had a look again we had panelists from Martinique from Mexico from Peru from Colombia from Brazil from UK from Burkina Faso Argentina Germany Finland and more so it was it was it was huge and we're so humble Yvette and myself um, that you all stretched the challenge challenge very challenging context around black artistic you know, perspectives in Latin America, the Caribbean, in Africa, and the rest of the global diaspora. So thanks so much for creating these networks, alive networks. And thanks so much for the brilliant translators. So Maria, you were, you made me cry. You, were, you, you know, your, the emotions in your voice really kept captured the whole, 
you know, the importance of what uh, the panelists were saying. It was really, oh, you know, I, I had goosebumps as well. <laughs> so it was really, it was amazing. And thanks to you, the audience, um, you know, for taking part and listening and, and uh, during the last days, sending in comments and questions. That was really fantastic. And finally, thanks to 154, Turia, Olivia, and the team uh, for having had the courage to organize, you know, the physical fair in London, which was really courageous of you. And yeah, to inviting us, Yvette and myself, to bring in all of us together and starting conversations. So thanks, I can't, it's a shame that we can't, you know, hug each other now, but it's, it's not possible. <laughs> We're gonna do this soon. So yeah, thanks so much. And um, yeah. see you soon. Bye. We'll be in touch. Bye. Yeah.